But the campaign to demonize Putin became very easy because Putin was Trump and Trump was Putin. And the number and, and Putin of- is Hitler, therefore Trump is also Hitler. Like <laughs> and the number they must the journalists must have had on their keyboards, and not just the journalists, the government officials, that you blame Putin. And in in doing that, so many didn't understand the problems of this country. It's a chance to, you know, if you blame it on a foreign power, it's not your fault. So you don't need to know the problems of your own country in a sense. And let's maybe move forward now to the second segment to talk about current affairs. Let's lay out what you think the Ukraine war is about and then in what the this horrible terror attack that happened uh, this week, last last weekend uh, on Moscow, on the Crocus City Hall, what that will change in the uh, in the way that this war is fought. Um, so I, d- I don't think history justifies the war, but it informs it. Again, I come back to NATO, the expansion. I think that plus the stationing of anti, of of defense missiles in Europe, close to Russia. Uh, But this war, Pascal, has been going on since maybe 2005 or 2013, 14, um, when you had the Maidan Square, we still don't know the full story of government snipers or Azov battalion snipers. And then you had a, clearly a US involvement. Victoria Newland, who by the way, has left the State Department. I think she lost out in a bureaucratic power shuffle. Um, she was, you know, she was cited talking to the um swearing about the EU, screw the EU, EU. We don't, you know, we're running this show. So there was, of course, US involvement, uh, but the, I don't know, I don't know about the history and the idea that Ukraine, um, you know, belongs to Russia. I mean, there's no question that if Russia feels there's a sister or brother country, it's Ukraine. And there's no question, and Obama recognized this, that Ukraine meant a hell of a lot more to Russia than to the United States. But it was war, it was an opening of aggression on the 22nd of February. Um, And the question now of how to resolve, um, I think the only way forward is a negotiated settlement, which is made much more difficult in these last days. I think there have been back channel gatherings. And what you know, Pascal, as much as I know, is that there were serious attempts early on in Istanbul in 2022 to find a way forward based on the Normandy agreements, the Minsk agreements, and um, who knows if it was Boris Johnson or who he stood for, who was behind him, that he comes in and disrupts that. Uh, Zelensky has made this his battle. His, you know, he, his power remains uh, because he's in the position he is. There's no question that um, this is a, you know, it's become a proxy war. The other day, Peskov, the press secretary in Russia, dropped the special operation, and they're just calling it war now because of the Western involvement. This is a proxy battle. Russia was down and out in 2003, Yeltsin 2000, when Putin spoke to the Munich Security Conference in 2007. Russia was back off its knees, and it, I think scared many who were in that room, McCain, Merkel, and there was a project to make Ukraine part of the West in a way that combined with NATO, combined with other projects has led us into this situation. I do think negotiated set, uh, negotiated resolution of the conflict, no NATO membership, membership in the EU, um, stability, security, guarantees. But NATO is, it seems to me, the the kind of project that has been at the core of the Ukraine war. 
Yeah, the the tragedy of it all is that Ukraine, when it when it became independent in uh, in ninety one, and then it was it was it took about two years until Ukraine really hammered out the constitution under which it it wanted to live. And in the nineteen ninety three constitution, there was a there was a provision for that said that Ukraine would aspire to be neutral, <laughs> aspire to be neutral. That was that was that was pretty interesting wording. And that held on until 2014, when like this cascade of things happened. And this, the chronology is really important, right? Maidan happens, uh, elected President Yanukovych is ousted, then the right wingers take over. And they officially declare they want to become part of NATO. Then Putin in, uh, or Russia invades uh, Crimea, takes it away, which then leads to another backlash. And the, the right wingers say, look, we were right. And the West says, oh, my God, you were right. And let's change the constitution to throw out the, the neutrality article and replace it with we aspire to be part of NATO. Basically, it's opposite. And it's all downhill from there. And it any is. realist has been saying for the last 10 years, guys, this is madness. Ukraine needs to be neutral for for geopolitical reasons. I mean, it's either neutrality, either permanent neutrality or permanent division. And as it looks right now, we are headed for the second one, permanent unfortunately. Um, and Crimea, by the way, is a, is another astonishing. I mean, that was, you know, it's a it's the Black Sea water mm -hmm. port, it's na naval military, and it's under siege today by drones. By the way, the shifting goalposts is an interesting story because President Biden and others vouched that no weapons would be used in Russia. Mm. Every day now, there, not only are there drones and other Western equipment being used, but the other day, the United States apparently asked Ukraine to stop bombing Russian oil fields, and Ukraine said no. And the Americans are worried about the gas prices rising. Um, that you mentioned, you didn't mention Zelensky. Zelensky was elected not really on a peace platform, but on a platform to kind of bring more stability. Because don't forget Poroshenko, and imagine if he was the leader in these last years, the chocolate oligarch who has business in Russia. Um, he was at war with the Donbas, Donetsk section of Ukraine. He called him anti, it was the anti terrorist uh, project or exercise to literally kill people, brethren and sisters in Donbass in order to fight Russia. But you're right, you need 2000 or 214 to the present. It can't be viewed as just starting in 2022 or uh, even after Zelensky was elected. So do, do you, you think- know, but I'll tell you what, Donald Rumsfeld, a name from the past. I don't know if you remember during Iraq, he began to call Europe, New Europe, Old Europe. And I had Old Europe posters all over my office, but you're witnessing the re, sort of re-architecturing of Europe in the sense of the Baltics and the Scandinavian countries, but certainly the Baltics playing an outsized role in the direction of support for NATO, support for, and you talk about narratives, Pascal. The narrative that Putin is the aggressor, you know, the misuse or misunderstanding of history. He's become Hitler, right? He's about to invade, but you know, there, and then they qu quote him as the imperialist. And he has certain certainly elements. And I remember when he came to power in 2000, when the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times said he's a man to do business with and the Nation editorial, which I wrote, said he's, you know, has tendencies toward authoritarianism and he's gonna be hard, it's gonna be different than Yeltsin. Um, but it's, um, I kind of, but the idea that he's um, pines for the Soviet Union and the empire, he's quoted as saying it was one of, the greatest geopolitical disasters of the 20th century. Well, in fact, he said a, one of a mistake, but he's also said anyone who believes the Soviet, the Soviet Union should be reconstituted has no head, but anyone who doesn't has no heart. I mean, he's kind of understanding that you have to move forward, but the Baltics, I think, want to relive 
a lot of their history in order to whip up uh, support from NATO, et cetera. It, it seems to me that, that we are witnessing another one of these moments where in, individual actors in the international sphere define themselves by who they are working against and how they are working against. My enemies, you know, make me a hero. So you need a good right. enemy in order to be a good, be a good hero. And, um, you know, when it comes to Vladimir Putin and Russia, the interesting thing about how Russia and the war has been portrayed over the last, let's say, two or three years, because remember, during co during COVID, during Corona, very little, very little uh, reporting, right? Uh, and then, very little. then the war swept away Corona and everything is there. And for the last two years, um, understanding Russia meant basically looking into the head of Putin, right? This is the mainstream media has equated Russia with Putin and with his head. And the funny thing is in German, you know, if you if you have contrarian views, the way that we are expressing them, you're being called a, not a Putin apologist, but a Putin understander. Oh, somebody who I know that word Putin. is so interesting. That Putin is such a thing. Yeah. What is it, Putin? Putin versteher. Versteher. Uh, understander. Russia... Somebody who understands him. So, Pascal, I would say in the context of media we were talking about earlier, it's often the case that in this country, people fix on one person, a leader yeah. in a yeah. country. So for the last 10 years, it's Putin, Putin, Putin. It was Yeltsin. But there's no coverage. There hasn't been until recently of the Russian Orthodox Church, of yeah. other forces, of the fact that many scholars believe Putin is more a referee of different forces in the Kremlin than just doing everything alone. I mean, he's killed many people. You know, I mean, there's so there's a lot he's done. Uh, but there's not an understanding of the history of the forces. And when there is an understanding of the history, it's often potted history and, you know, t built to support a war. It's very hard to have real analysis at time of war. So we've lost that opportunity. But you're so right that it's just. And then you had, Pascal, do not forget the campaign in this country by Hillary Clinton's campaign. Oh, yes. It's reported that the day after this terrible loss, this shock, her campaign manager and one or two others said, we're going to blame Russia. They could have blamed joblessness in Wisconsin. They could have blamed Comey. She might have been heartbroken that her closest assistant's spouse was, you know, I mean, but the campaign to demonize Putin became very easy because Putin was Trump and Trump was Putin. And, the number and, and Putin of, is Hitler. Therefore, Trump is also Hitler. Like, <laughs> and the number they must the journalists must have had on their keyboards, and not just the journalists, the government officials, that you blame Putin, and in in doing that, so many didn't understand the problems of this country. It's a chance to you know if you blame it on a foreign power, it's not your fault. So you don't need to know the problems of your own country in a sense. But the demonization, I mean, my my late husband was a brilliant scholar. His book on Bukharan, an alternative to Stalinism, was, you know, not only read by Gorbachev, but it was in incited changes. Um, he was named names by, I think, every young journalist like Yuli Yoffe and James Kerchik had to attack Steve in order to have a notch on their belt. And, you know, he didn't care that much because he was semi-retired. He had tenure. He had achieved quite a bit. But it's very dangerous for younger people. And he always advised his graduate students and students, you don't have to be so forthright uh, now. He didn't want to inflict some of the attacks that he was receiving onto those who are trying to make their way, though others have found their way on their own to, to que find truth. Question of personal interest, but I, I do also think that it is dangerous to, to, to do this kind of alternative narratives and try to uncover, and we are seeing that, right? Julian Assange is not in prison because he did anything, uh, because he killed anyone. He's in prison because he unmasked the killing of people. Nothing people. that he published was actually wrong. There were no lies. It was all true, but it is truths that were not convenient. And that's why he's in prison. And that's why he's being slowly killed in front of our eyes in order to deter others from ever even thinking of publishing something that they know the U.S. could try to get them. Because the whole idea is whether you're Australian um, on living abroad, the U.S. will get you if you yeah. dare 
to disclose something. But so this is dangerous. But but I do feel that this house is burning in the first floor and people are, st are sleeping in, in uh, upstairs. Yeah. And it, it's just I, I don't think we have time to wait <laughs> until no, we have I think dinner you're... and are retired to actually say something because we are we're literally I mean, we are closer to Armageddon than during the Cuban Missile Crisis, or equally close. Maybe, no, no, maybe no. Crazy. I mean, listen, Secretary William Perry, who was the uh, defense secretary under Bill Clinton, you know, the, Steve used to, uh, when we were in Moscow, it used to be said that people became dissidents when they went on pension. So Perry is 97 years old, living near labs in California. He said that two years ago, this is more dangerous. The nuclear peril is more dangerous than during the height of the Cold War. By the way, I'm not sure what we call this era because people keep saying after the Cold War. This is more than the Cold War in many ways because it's tripolar, it's quadrupolar. And the and the unraveling of the arms control. Arms control is a very stolid word. You know, it's kind of boring. And I do think it's hard to have real arms control without political change, but it's unraveled. I mean, and the 2002 unraveling of the ABM treaty, I think really was the last point. Now, Trump, who gets blamed for being Putin, banished, barred the last agreement, the open skies, I think 2007, 17. But it's so dangerous. It, but you know what? Here's what's different. When I was at the nation in 1982, briefly, there were a million people in Central Park calling for the abolition of the missiles in Europe, INF. So they didn't want them there. Yeah, but something happened that when the Soviet Union, and by the way, another talk, but was abolished. When the Soviet Union was abolished, the idea that we were safe became embedded among a younger generation. And it's true that climate is an existential crisis, but that doesn't mean you ignore the nuclear peril which is real and it's almost mocked because Putin will say, you know, the danger of nuclear weapons, but people don't listen and they don't read as carefully. And it's a real, I do think there will be an awakening on that issue. I I, I do. I think the one thing that could awake, awaken people is when they really get scared, because to me, the, the, <laughs> I, I don't think Sweden and Finland joined NATO because they were so scared of Russia, um, because that would that would mean that today Sweden and Finland are more scared of Russia than they were from the so by the Soviet Union back in the days. And that makes no sense. So the thing is, people are not scared enough. Uh, they think that everything will be fine and you can, you can do once the once the fear sets in, this will this will this, this might change things. But the question is, is it will it already be too late? But you know, Pascal, there is going to be fear. We haven't talked about the impact of the terror terrorist yeah. acts in Moscow. I mean, there's going to be possibly a renewal of the death penalty, ending yeah. the moratorium and the in Russia. Torture. Yeah, in Russia, and there was fear here, 9/11, and people hoped that the fear would lead Americans to learn more about the world outside, but it didn't. It brought people inside. We had debates about torture. Abu Ghraib. I mean, it was a full degradation of an already difficult system. But in Russia, you know, I was there during Beslan, this uh, a terrorist attack on the school. I was in Moscow, not there, at the when the Dubrovka theater was uh, raided by terrorists. And the reaction has often been very tough because Putin, part of his coming to power was not only to give immunity to the Yeltsin family, but to finish off the Second Chechen War. And I personally, there's some evidence that, for example, Anna Polikovskaya is reporting on torture and corruption. Chechnya contributed to her death. Chechnya has been a place of metastasizing danger. And I think you're going to see closing of the border in Russia. You're going to see hardline uh, politics and actions. I don't see, maybe you do, a, a way toward jump-starting negotiations with Ukraine in this climate right now. And I think it was on the track, which always raises the question, was there an interruption of moving in that direction? Um, 
And you, you, you said it earlier, Peskov actually dropped the special military operation and is using the word uh, war, which used to be, you know, people used to get punished for, for doing that because That's it wasn't, right. wasn't something that, that was wanted. For, and, them for an enemy. Uh, uh, a couple of months or a year ago, an, uh, a Russian observer made, made a very important point saying that there is a huge difference between a military operation and war in terms of operational uh, planning on the ground. Interesting. Um, do you do you think that we this, this event now might actually you know make the war much worse uh, because the Russians will 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 see it even more as an existential threat that needs to be eliminated and we know what the United States did when it portrayed Iraq or Afghanistan as existential threats it didn't end well for these places. What we're seeing it seems to me Pascal are different narratives right now inside Russia. They're playing you know there's. They're accepting that it was the Islamist threat, but they're still pointing to possible ties with Ukraine. Which would make sense. I mean, the, that that there might be connections that that could be, could, could also be. not be, there but could... it's sellable. It's sellable. So if they drive that, then you could see an uptick. Now, neither side has, again, the mobilization. Don't discount that because politically, I think Putin was going to do mobilization after the election and 88%. He would have probably gotten 70 percent without the strong arm tactics to vote. But I'm, I just it's unclear if they go hard on the Islam, Islamic threat instead of more on Ukraine. They're already fighting fiercely. Right. So if you how do you amp it up? I guess an extra bombing every day, not to be callous. Um, what do you think? Do you think that it will lead to more um, war activity? in Ukraine or I I I don't know Russia enough uh, neither neither how the institutions work nor how the mentality works to predict that I am a, a, a horrible optimist so when I read that the Germans were con uh, sending condolences to Russia I thought well there is at least a possibility that this tragedy might lead to somewhere better diplomatic relations because you can finally and you you see that you can finally uh agree on grieving for the innocent people and that's 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 you know this works against the logic of war the logic of war always wants you to hate your enemy and right. this this collective grieving for innocence that could be a cornerstone to to dialogue but it's probably going to be squandered as it's usually squandered by by the participants who by will, other who forces will... By other forces, by the hawks, because the hawks hate this. The hawks hate it, and they immediately want to concentrate again on what we can hate about each other. No, the the war the war parties may triumph in this moment, and I'm dismayed, as I said, that there has it, apparently there hasn't been any real outreach from high level U.S. government official. Yeah, and that the would Biden, be... you know, I think that there's there's a time for empathy, and there's a time for dialogue, and there's a time for other things, but. I do feel um, that that has been lost in the last few days. The other thing I don't, it's just a point, but people don't read. They, I mean, in the sense that there's a quick, I'm sure you've seen this everywhere, that Putin was er er arrogantly dismissed the U.S. warning. By the way, that was interesting, the protection, you know, the duty to protect that that exists. But if you read the full statement of March 19th, Putin talking to the federal security forces in the Kremlin, he goes on and says, this is very serious. We must pay attention. Let us increase our forces. But the quickness to often categorize Putin as arrogant, as dismissive, as anti-American, people don't read the speeches. Now, you know, that's so they, the ability of a media to quickly categorize or stereotype is made easier by the fact. Now, reading may be a subversive act soon. Reading, reading the wrong sources or listening to the wrong sources. The good sources yes. are fine. Uh, Katerina van den Heuvel, I would like to thank you very much for the discussion today. Thank you very much.